Hello, everybody. I'll just wait for a couple of uh, seconds of more, more participants, and then I will get started. Very good. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much uh, for attending. Uh, I am Anatol Levin, Director of the Eurasia Programme at the Quincy Institute, and it is my great pleasure today uh, to uh, introduce uh, Professor Andrei Tsigankov of San Francisco State University. Uh, before I do introduce him, I'd just like to mention before I forget uh, that um, we have another event at Quincy tomorrow which I hope you will attend at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, not 12, uh, which is a debate between uh, our own Jake Warner, I'm sorry, Werner, Jake Warner of uh, our East Asia program uh, and Michael Beckley uh, on the subject, uh, is US-China conflict inevitable? I think we could have given this the title that uh, Churchill gave to plans for his funeral, Operation Hope Not. Uh, anyway, I hope that you will be able to attend that as well. Now, today it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce, as I say, Dr. Andrei Tsigankov. Uh, Dr. Tsigankov is the most distinguished, in my view, student of traditions in Russian foreign policy and Russian history, uh, working today, certainly in the, in the English language. Uh, he is author of numerous books on the subject, uh, last year, the fifth edition of his book, Continuity and Change, his standard text on the subject in Russian foreign policy, uh, was published. And this, this year, he has published a book on the Russian idea in Russian foreign policy. Uh, Andrei, welcome. It seems to me that uh, through your books, you've also uh, published a volume on realism, in Russian foreign policy, uh, that what you have done for Russian foreign policy is really what Walter Russell Mead did for American foreign policy in his book, Special Providence, which is that you have delineated the, the deep historical cultural traditions, different ones in Russian foreign policy thinking, uh, and shown uh, how these contrast with each other, how they, however, also sometimes run together, uh, and also, and of course critically, how they continue to shape um, Russian foreign policy behaviour today. Uh, so could you describe to us, please, how you see those, those different traditions uh, and uh, how, how they are indeed operating in, in the world that, uh, unfortunately, we see before us today? Thank you. Anatol, thank you so much for inviting me. It's my honor to be here. Also, thank you for mentioning Walter Russell Mead, who has been one of my inspirations as I was writing this uh, trilogy on Russian foreign policy schools of thought. This is something that I have begun doing with realism. This year, you mentioned I published on civilizational theories, which is what the Russian idea in international relations is. And I am now trying to finish the last uh, slim volume on Westernizers, the third tradition. So these are the three traditions that I have developed an interest in a while ago, since I was in grad school in the late 1990s. And then I became a grad student at USC and continue to be interested in that. The basic idea of the book that you mentioned is that um, there are different considerations behind Russian foreign policy, but the book is mainly about ideas and the influence on Russian foreign policy. Two sets of ideas. So it's about three things. First, political ideas of national interests, sometimes, in uh, policy circles, especially national interests are viewed as relatively fixed concept. Uh, 
but in practice, they change. They continue with some older traditions, but they also change by answering the question, what to do in foreign policy. And so it's about different visions of national interests, beginning with Gorbachev. The book covers the last 40 years or so, the end of the Cold War, Gorbachev's idea of common European home, new thinking, Boris Yeltsin's vision of integration with the West, which was very much viewed as Russia's national interest at the time. Vladimir Putin's early ideas of uh, pragmatic partnership with the West, as long as the West recognizes Russia as a great power, Russia was willing to go at length to cooperate with the West. And then other ideas, including Nigeni Primakov, Dmitry Medvedev, and then more recent Putin's assertiveness, civilization. So it's about political ideas of national interests, but it's also the second level, very much about these social ideas, historically developed ideas of what Russia is. Because before you know what to do, you need to know who you are. What are your values? Who are your most important, significant others? And this is where schools of thought come into play because Russia historically developed those who are committed to values of state sovereignty, great power, those that we typically associate with realism. And these are, I would submit, uh, the most influential ideas up until today. Then, of course, there are those who continue to believe that Russia is a part of the larger West, Atlantic West and uh, continental West, European tradition. These are the Westernizers. They are not as influential anymore. In fact, they are largely marginalized, most of them, in today's context. And then the third group are those who believe in Russia's special cultural mission, special cultural values, Eastern Christianity association with Byzantium, Slavic values, the Eurasia, uh, uh, the Eurasia, Eurasian empire, Eurasia is the old vision that goes back to the post-revolutionary developments. And even before then, so this is the third school and they are interaction they are mutually interact, they reinforce each other's thinking sometimes, influence in policy circles. And politicians often draw on these ideas, as I think Keynes said once, politicians often express ideas of dead political philosophers. So these are the political philosophical ideas that continue to shape Russia. This is where history comes in, this is where the uh, interaction with political ideas come in. And this is what Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Putin, Medvedev, and others conscientiously or subconsciously draw upon. So that's the second level. Here you have, the book was written for academics, so I, I engaged with neostructural realism, which continues to be the uh, dominant realist tradition in academic circles. I know in policy circles, classical realism is somewhat more popular. And then liberals as well, those who stress the nature of political system, Putin's character, regime structure, and so forth. They also, their explanation is also insufficient for multiple reasons. So this is why it's significant. We also need to understand, in addition to what people do in foreign policy, in addition to how Russia organizes its foreign policy, we need to understand the meaning behind this, why Russians do what they do. And schools of thought is a way to establish what Russian national identity is, has been, how it has persisted and changed across time. And the third level is, of course, policy itself. Russian foreign policy directions. Russia has changed as a result of its change in identity uh, competition because different identities, those that are relatively pro-Western and those that are relatively anti-Western produce different identity coalitions, different visions of national interests. And that political struggle ultimately leads to the state embracing one of these visions as its own. And that's what happened in Russian foreign policy. Uh, these foreign policy visions 
national interest visions have fluctuated, but roughly Russia went through the period of cooperation, was trying to build strong partnership with the West all the way until the mid 2000s. So for some 15 years, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and then Putin, his first term, were trying to get along with the West, were trying to be a part of the West, were trying to join Western institutions. All of them, including Vladimir Putin, wanted to be in NATO or in European security structures. And then for various reasons that we can discuss, and the, since the year 2000, Russia began to depart from these cooperative policies and began to assert itself on the international scene, with the exception of Medvedev's spirit, which was in many ways the last attempt to cooperate with the West, Russia was moving forward in a very different direction, in the opposite direction from cooperation. After the uh, Munich speech that Putin delivered after the Bucharest summit that NATO held, in which it invited Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO, Russia was moving in a very different direction. Already since the uh, United States decision to walk away from the ABM treaty, Putin was developing different military programs that we late, he later revealed to the world. And it was preparing for a future potential crisis with the West including perhaps the one that we're in right now. So this assertiveness course continued, and this is what has begun not in 2022, not even in 2014, but actually earlier than that, soon after the Munich speech, soon after the Russia-Georgia military conflict, Russia was beginning to challenge the West and was trying to pursue its own concept of interest. I also have a brief theory developed in this book and developed at length in a different volume on why Russia acts the way it does. And it has to do very much with domestic challenges that Russia goes through, but it also has to do with the behavior of the West, because the West is the significant other of Russia. The way the West acts by recognizing or refusing to recognize Russia as its own, its status, its interests, its values, contributes greatly to, to which identity coalition prevails and ultimately which foreign policy is being developed by Russian policymakers. Putin was prepared initially to build stronger relationships with the West, but he was also statist in his, in his beliefs. He was never prepared to go as far as Gorbachev or as far as Boris Yeltsin, he was prepared to compromise, he was prepared to cooperate, but on the condition that Russia remains and is recognized as such, as a great power with its own sphere of interest, with its own ideas of what its contribution will be to the world. And it's a subject of negotiations, but nevertheless, it's something that he was prepared to entertain until he saw that the United States was not prepared to move in this direction until he saw that the United States was more interested in expanding NATO at the expense of Russia's security perceptions in intervening in foreign policy from Yugoslavia to Iraq and Libya, in promoting its own institutions, and again, at the expense of Russia's perceived sphere of cultural influence, at the expense even of Russia's institutions. Because the idea was, and remains as far as I can see, that the West has the crystal ball, so to speak, when it comes to institutions. Democracy is Western style democracy is universal value. And therefore, Russia will be better off by adopting our values, our standards. In this securitized context, it was actually perceived by Vladimir Putin and by others as a regime change in preparation, as something that the West was um, eagerly entertaining to do following by following the uh, Rose Revolution in Georgia and even before uh, in Serbia. And then of course the Orange Revolution um, and Kyrgyzstan and others. The idea was, whether you and I agree with this or not, the idea was that the West was actually expanding 
all of its institutions, all of its military structures at our expense. And therefore, if we don't do something about this, if we don't do the red line, then the West will not be able to stop. So this crisis was brewing, so to speak, long time before 2020, and even, even a long time before 2014, which is the crisis when Russia annexed Crimea, when there was a Euromaidan revolution, and so forth and so on. Thank you. Uh, by the way, to the audience, I've got to mention, um, uh, Andrea and I will talk for about another 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, I will ask questions on on behalf of the audience. Could you please send uh, write your questions in the Q and A, uh, and I will then I'll probably lump some together, uh, and I will put them myself to to Andre. So do please use the um, the Q and A. I mean, yes, it seems to me that only the fundamental tragedy of the Westernizers in in Russia uh, is that the West defined Westernization. Uh, as including basically complete agreement to Western or even just US uh, policy, in international policy agendas. And I have to say, I mean, a good many uh, liberal Westernizers in Russia also uh, assimilated this, but clearly that was never going to be acceptable to the Russian establishment as a whole, or even probably ultimately. Um, the, the, the mass of the Russian people, and also for these historical reasons. And yes, I mean, it's very important to note that uh, Putin started as, well, two things. I mean, one, Putin started as a westernizer, but also on what we might call Putin's terms, what he would call Russia's terms, and did shift, I mean, very much in response to things that the West did. Because one of the fundamental flaws of uh, the debate, if you can call it that, about Russia uh, in the US today is that it attributes everything to Russian actions, Russian decisions, and almost never asks about what the impact of our behavior was, which if you turn things around and say that American policy you know, is unaffected by what other countries do, people would look at you as if you were crazy, which indeed you would be, and yet we, you know, we project this strange attitude onto Russia. But a question I had is, um, Putin's swing from what at one stage was called the vision of the Third West sometimes, which is Russia as a Third West, um, distinctive, just as you know, America differs from, uh, from Western Europe, uh, but nonetheless part of the wider West, to now once again this Eurasian vision of Russia as a separate civilization. How deep, in your view, does that go in Putin and his immediate associates? Uh, or is it something which they have more, uh, which either they have been forced to adopt, uh, they feel the need to adopt to build up Russia against the West? Is it in fact a deeply held and deeply thought out philosophy, or is it more instrumental than, than that in your view? I think that's that's the key word and authority that you used. It's instrumental in many respects. Putin was, remains, and will continue to be a politician. He will draw from different ideational segments as he sees necessary, as he sees helpful to reinforce his political grip. Russia, as any countries, including the United States, very much forms its policies based on domestic considerations, on who prevails in political circles, that group of people, that school, to, school of thought will be able to influence policymakers if it commands the uh, attention at the time. The Kremlin is quite sophisticated in measuring attitudes, calls, and identifying where the people are. And um, during the 90s, the idea of westernization was popular, certainly before the shock therapy started, um, as Yeltsin's economic reforms 
it was extremely popular for political reasons, for domestic political re reasons, to draw from the westernizers' poll. Elites were very pro-Western at the time. And then slowly but surely, in part because Russia's economic reform from social perspective was a disaster. It killed the middle class. It uh, essentially destroyed 50% of the country's GDP. It created the uh, trauma of the lost state. All of this, alongside rising crime and instability, created... The and if I could just cut in, yes. uh, the fact that so much of the money stolen Absolutely. as part of this process was transferred to the West. Absolutely. Corruption uh, was, was rampant, and corruption was rampant alongside of uh, uh, financial leaks from the country, uh, contributing, of course, to the Western wealth. All of this ultimately contributed to the perception that somehow the West is responsible. It is behind all of this. And if you add to this also a uh, lack of security for, for elites, at least, for the larger population, this is a different story, but for elites, for Russian elites, for Russian security class, which is very influential, this is one of the key issues. All of this contributed to the sense that we must somehow stand up. We must do something about this or else. And so this group that used to be called Westernizers is now divided and marginalized. I'm not saying that these ideas that Russia is a part of the larger West have entirely disappeared from the political scene. They're, they're still there. In fact, some of you have heard about it, I'm sure, Vladislav Surkov, who used to be the uh, deputy head of presidential administration, recently published an article called The Great Norse, in which he again articulates the same idea that Russia would be a part of the three Romes the American Rome, the uh, European Rome, and Russia will be still the third Rome against the global South. So there will be a new divide between global North and global South. Um, he has perhaps other ideas why he has articulated this vision, but the fact that someone like Surkov continues to entertain this vision tells you something. These ideas are still there, they're floating around, they are marginalized for various, mostly political reasons. And certainly many Westernizers are pushed out of the country for their beliefs, but there are still many who continue to be relatively moderate, interested in developing relationships with the West, but not necessarily on the West, on the current liberal West terms. They want to have what Putin stands for, which is again sovereignty, status, the flexibility in foreign policy. Right now, the world has changed. Russia has options. It has choices to develop relationships with China, India, Turkey, and others. And certainly, Russians would like to have those options. But at the same time, Westernizers are still there. They have not disappeared. So this is one school. And I continue to be interested in that school today. The uh, most important school continues to be the statists, or if you want to call them realists, that would be a Russian version of statism. But they are also quite diverse, these people. Historically, there were those who stressed that the West is our ultimate enemy. We must balance against the West. Um, this is perhaps the dominant school today. This is something that Vladimir Putin subscri subscribes to. But there used to be also those who believe that the state is best protected in alliance or in partnership with the West. These are, you might call, realist westernizers. And this is what Putin quintessentially has been when he came to power in the year 2000. He believed in partnership with the West, but he also believed in preserving great power status. And then there is, there is the third group of isolationists or relative isolationists, regionalists, Eurasianist, you just asked me about Eurasianism, whether Putin is serious about this. Putin wants to draw on Eurasianist ideas as well, but Eurasianism is also an umbrella term. You can interpret it very differently. You can be relatively liberal if you want, for example, develop regional Eurasian open community 
and Russians have the so-called Greater Eurasia Project, in which they you can move. be you, you can be a Kazakh Eurasianist. For you can be a Kazakh Eurasianist. You can be imperialist. You can be uh, uh, someone who favors Eurasian autarky, building neo-Soviet orders. You can be Alexander Dugin, who wants to be essentially greater Eurasian empire against the United States as, an, as a quintessential uh, Atlantic civilization. And he only believes in the competition of two civilizations, Eurasianism on the one hand, and Atlantic Westernism on the other. So you, you also have to unpack Eurasianism. And Putin uses Eurasianism strategically for his own purposes, just as he has used Danilevsky, just as he has cited on multiple occasions Ivan Ilyin, who was a Slavophile rather than Eurasianist, although a particular Slavophile. He used many other civilizationist ideas that still does not mean that he is predominantly civilizationist. His main preoccupation was in the 90s, in the early 2000s, and today is how to preserve Russia as a great power, Russia as a strong state, and certainly he believes that Russia must have special cultural responsibility, particularly strong relations with Ukraine, with Ukrainians, and this is certainly one of the roots of the crisis that we're in today. But he was still and remains mainly the status, and his imperialism, if you will, is the distant second motivation in why Russia went to war with Ukraine. So this book that I just mentioned to you, it tells you something about this crisis that we're in today, but it doesn't tell you anything everything. It tells you specifically that it has roots not only in Vladimir Putin's thinking, although Putin, of course, bears the main responsibility. He is the one who processed all these factors. He is the one who decided to do what he, do, what he did. He had other choices how to respond to these perceived security threats. He decided to invade the entire Ukraine. That was his choice. But it's also important to stress that he was acting on the objectively existing structural factors. One of them you and, I have, you, and, you and I have discussed already, that's the role of the West, that's all these expansionist policies, strategies that the West pursued uh, while at the same time ignoring Russia's interests and considerations in Europe, in Eurasia. But the other one has to do with Ukraine as well. Ukrainian project, is another structural factor. And this affinity between the West and Ukraine is also something that trapped Putin the wrong way. Because Ukrainians embarked essentially on the idea that they need to build their own national identity against Russia's identity, against Russia's history, against the building strong relationships with, with Russia. And it wasn't just Zelensky. This project goes back to uh, Viktor Yushchenko after the Orange Revolution, who uh, awarded medals of national honor to people like Roman Shukhevich, who was uh, fighting the uh, Soviet Union alongside Nazi and others. It was even earlier than that. It was after all Leonid Kravchuk with his referendum of independence that ultimately ended the Soviet Union. So without that, Gorbachev probably would have continued to negotiate the new Union Treaty. So Ukraine contributed to all these developments by uh, strengthening this connection with NATO, by trying to join NATO already in the year 2000 or earlier, by also making more difficult for ethnic Russians, for those who lived inside Ukraine and who gravitated to Russia, to preserve the relationships with Russia. And it all got exacerbated after the Euromaidan revolution when the new leadership um, banned Russian language from circulation, at least initially. Uh, then Zelensky came to power and arrested uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, who was also the head of pro-Russian faction in the uh, Ukrainian Rada, Ukrainian parliament. And then he refused to sign on the Minsk Accord, which was negotiated by Russia um, and Ukraine and several European powers. And again, slowly but surely, Putin decided 
that he cannot, in principle, negotiate anymore, he will have to do something about this. That was his decision. So the book, therefore, helps you to understand that the context was already there, that Russia was moving in this direction of a confrontation with the West even before 2014. Uh, what the book doesn't tell you about is, of course, Putin's own emotional beliefs, because the book is primarily about national identity, vision, schools, uh, and it tells you about Putin's um, process in this state is beliefs, identity beliefs, uh, cognitive, cognitively, it does give you an idea of who Putin was, but it doesn't tell you, and this is something that needs to be developed, and I try to develop it else, elsewhere, what kind of a personality Putin was outside his cognitive beliefs. And of course, it's, it's crucial in this case. In this case, it was ultimately what he, we call in foreign policy, decision-making analysis rather than structural factors that made a difference. This is where structural realism, by the way, has very little to say. So Putin, of course, uh, is a very important and interesting to study psychological character. He has particular emotional beliefs. He, for example, is risk averse, but he is a risk taker under pressure. Under pressure, he can go very far. We have seen multiple examples of this. He is also someone who typically remembers all the perceived offenses and disrespect for Russia and finds a way somehow to get back at those who offended Russia. In uh, non-Western circles, he is someone who has a reputation of a good negotiator, someone uh, who, who keeps his word, someone who is able to deliver as a statesman, not in the West though, and he's someone who also always responds as well, rather than being, being a long thinker, strategic thinker, he always responds to perceived actions by the West. And this interaction that he had with Joe Biden, very unhealthy interaction, also greatly contributed to the crisis. So this part of Putin is not in the book, but the other part, cognitive part, is there. Last question from me, because you also published something else this year, was, which was a chapter in the book edited by Oliver Boyd Barrett and Stephen Mamura uh, on Russiagate uh, revisited uh, and um, did something which I feel is extremely necessary, which was to um, you know, bring out what has now been pretty firmly established uh, about R Russiagate by the Durham report, for example. I wondered could you just say briefly, um, well, first, uh, the, the thesis of the, of the book or your part of the book, but secondly, what impact do you think that the Russia gate, I think we must call it chiefly hoax now, uh, had on Russian official thinking about the US? Well, you, you already essentially unpacked the uh, main thesis, the main contribution of the book, this is probably the only definitive statement on the uh, Russia gate as a hoax, essentially. Uh, you also have a very important uh, book by Richard Sakwa on uh, Russia gate. He will uh, be speaking uh, to us uh, later this year. Perfect, perfect. So I'm sure he will tell you about that book as well. Uh, he has a new book out, uh, which is a different subject, but that book by Richard greatly influenced the uh, Russia gate by, uh, by uh, Steve Mamura and uh, Oliver Boyd, uh, Boyd Barrett because it has a comprehensive layout. It has um, almost investigative analysis of all the stages that Russia gate went through uh, ever since the um, uh, DNC hack took place, and even even with some routes before, uh, and, and certainly since the uh, steel dossier and the uh, collusion narrative that was then developed, uh, not only in the steel dossier but the uh, in the um, um, New York Times and many other media, then Mueller report is covered there extensively. There is a chapter on domestic politics of, of the uh, Russia gate in the United States. 
And there is also, to the extent possible, because John Durham report that you mentioned is relatively recent, but to the extent possible, there is an analysis of all that has been done on this front as well. In particular, the authors uh, state, and in my opinion, uh, persuade the reader, uh, argue successfully that not only Mueller concluded that there is no evidence of collusion. Mueller report, of course, is already old. This is uh, April 19, 2019, if I remember correctly. But John Durham also concluded that not only uh, there are no evidence of collusion, but actually there was no even basis for FBI investigation. So the FBI should have not opened that case uh, in the first place. So here it has a chronology, it has an analysis, it has a Russia's perception of this as well, which is partly your question, how did Russians perceive this? Most of them, and I would say most, but not all, most people I know, most people in expert circles I often interview, saw this as a greatest sign of weakness on part of the United States as a great sign of psychological loss of confidence. That this great power that used to control the world, used to think that it controlled the world, now is falling apart. Now they're finding enemies on the outside. They are at loss on how to present themselves. This is about their own identity. Remember the uh, other, the significant other is essential. So for the United States, they need to have the significant other. Now it's China, but at the time it was also Russia as the useful enemy. Um, uh, and that's, that's how it was perceived. And I think in policy circles, at least some people around Vladimir Putin saw this as a sign that the United States is not the same anymore. The United States is deeply polarized it's losing its position on the international scene, it's declining, it's becoming weaker, and that perhaps is good for us as long as we're able to assert our interests. To the extent, to the extent Biden's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan contributed to Putin's decision to ultimately use force in Ukraine. And I think one could argue that this has had the same effect here. Thank you. Now, questions uh, from from the audience. Uh, well, the first, obviously, the most important and difficult and urgent today from Jim Ryan. In your opinion, uh, what can the US and NATO offer to Russia uh, to end the war in Ukraine? What could be the terms? I mean, is it is there the possibility uh, of a compromise agreement uh, to end the war or at least to bring about a ceasefire in Ukraine. What do you think? Well, um, what what is not going to be successful, we can start with that. What is not going to be successful is the insistence that Russia simply withdraw from all the Ukrainian territory, including Crimea, and begin to negotiate. That is now a non-starter, simply because Russians have come to the conclusion that A, they cannot trust the West, they have been deceived on multiple occasions, and B, they are largely prepared for a long war. They were not prepared for a long time a year ago. Now they are, at least in their perception, this is going to be a long war. And unless we have something really important, really attractive to us now, we can continue and take what we want by force. So in their perception, and you can challenge that perception too, but in their perception, the longer the war goes on, the more likely they are to fully prevail and ultimately to have Ukraine capitulated and the West humiliated as a result of this. So if you want to negotiate now from their perception, you have to accept what they call realities on the ground, which is the current borders. You have to promise that Ukraine will become neutral and you have somehow also to find a way to respect Russian or pro-Russian communities, communities inside Ukraine. What formula it will be, I am unable to say. Uh, 
but this is where the Russians are today. And some will say that Putin, in fact, is not prepared even for that because he is a believer that he will not be secure until Russia will take on more regions, until Odessa, Nikolaev, Kharkiv, and Kherson will be added to the already uh, uh, conquered territories in Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporizhia, and half of Kherson. So here, I think the debate is whether Putin is prepared to negotiate. Uh, I, think, I think some signs show that Putin is willing to entertain uh, possibilities and offers from the West, but they will have to be realistic as he sees them. Yes. J journalists sometimes ask me the question, what is Putin thinking? And I, <laughs> I have to say, <laughs> don't we all wish we knew? As you say, there are indications, but um, anyone who says that they know for sure is, is deceiving themselves. One thing, one thing we know, Anatoly, that there is also, if Putin is a hawk, that there are also super hawks behind mm -hmm. him. Yeah. And these super hawks are pushing to end the long war. They don't believe in the long war. They want this war to be short, decisive. And uh, if Putin is constrained domestic, uh, domestically, then it is, at least at the moment, predominantly by these people. People uh, who are uh, such as Prigozhin and uh, Strelkov and uh, several in the media who believe in the use of short range nukes and uh, escalation in other ways, including shooting down American men uh, um, uh, uh, let uh, drones across the Black Sea fleet. Uh, today, for example, Margarita Simonian proposed that Russia use thermonuclear bomb over Siberia, in which case she says it will be humane, no one will suffer, but all radio electronic devices, all internet and other connections will be gone. Yeah. So that's another proposal from that faction. Yes, I read an estimate that that would cost the United States economy Forty billion dollars a week, I think, was the figure. It was I mean, it's an estimate, but the economic consequences would be devastating, of course, for Russia too. Though one must say, of course, Prigozhin is dead, and uh, Strelkov appears to be under at least a house arrest. That's right. So Putin, Putin does does seem to be at the moment, at least, pushing back. Uh, it does. It yes. does tell you that Putin is in control. He remains in control, and he was able to, um, at least for now, he was able to control this faction as well of super hawks. They're still there. Some of them are very much loyal to Putin. So they are urgently or cautiously pushing him to move in this direction. Others are taking hard line and those who have are now behind the bar, such as Trilko. Another critical question from John Steinmeier. Do you think that Russia's long-term interests are compatible with China's long-term interests? Because, of course, in the past, uh, and uh, until you know, the, the invasion of Ukraine, you would find in talking in private with members of the Russian establishment, um, I mean, very considerable concerns about the risk of Russia becoming completely dependent on China. Uh, China, of course, so much bigger than Russia, um, and with a huge land border, and of course, with potential territorial disputes. Have those Russian concerns vanished as a result of the war in Ukraine and the new, you know, intense um, tension with the West? Uh, or do they, in your view, continue under the surface? That's a, that's a very important question. I think, I think that Russia cannot in principle, have all its interests being compatible with China or with the West, for that matter. Uh, as any great power, it has its own uh, interest in Eurasia, its own interest in Europe, and they cannot be fully compatible. The question is whether it can develop ultimately foreign policy that will not be antagonistic to either one of those that will ultimately develop to the extent possible, economic and security cooperation with both, because Russia is geographically uh, 
And historically, especially if you move to the pre-Peter the Great era, Eurasian, not just European. And therefore, it must have, it must stand on both feet, so to speak. And it must have even-handed relationships with China, with which it has the longest territorial border. And it must have strong relationships with Europe as well. And it has to be done only if Russia is sufficiently confident and, it, and if it is sufficiently strong as a military power, it simply cannot afford to invest only in liberal thinking. It must be military major power, and therefore Russia cooperates with China. And even today, Russia exports and even shares with China some very sensitive technologies. Uh, we can talk about the, these technologies uh, uh, separately. There is a long list of those that Russia has shared with China so far. But the basic rule up until recently, even including today, has always been that we share with China not the most recent developments. The most recent developments, developments we still hold to ourselves. Um, and therefore, even this alliance, if it can be called an alliance, some call it... Uh, partnership untanned even with China is also conditioned on Russian sovereignty, on Russian future survival, on Russia's existential perception of its own security. Um, therefore, there is a limit to this partnership. But of course, it's not just about security. Russia must develop all kinds of economic relations with China, trade, and it wants to be not just raw material appendix, which is what it has been uh, up until recently. It must, it must find a way to Chinese markets, not just in terms of sharing it, its resources, and oil and gas. And that's also a very important challenge. And Chinese are not easy to negotiate with. They will not let you into their markets easily. You have to do your part. And it has to be also give and take. And until the war is over, and if the war is over largely on uh, non-Russian terms, then Chinese will have another leverage. So there is a danger here that Russia will have to compromise its sovereignty. So far, it has walked a very delicate balance. A question from Barry Posen. Uh, Western politicians believe that NATO threatens no one. Um, they may, of course, <laughs> not be honest about that. They certainly speak as if they simply do not understand what Russia is afraid of. So specifically, what was Russia afraid of uh, concerning Ukrainian um, and I would add Georgian uh, membership of NATO and the, and the European Union? Well, uh, this, is, this is a matter of public record. Both Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov and military officials, I might add, explained at length why they would resist this. Uh, you might add to this also missile defense system developments and non-NATO militarization. Putin views this in, as a combination of all of these potentially threatening Russia's security developments from the West. And he argues that even if Ukraine is not in NATO right now, then the fact that you're investing so much in Ukraine right now probably means that it will become member of NATO at some point. Um, and he mentioned on several occasions that if you have uh, radars and interceptors in close proximity to Russia, then at some point they, will, they can be converted into Tomahawk launches, and it's really close to Russian sensitive sites. Um, he talked about uh, 10 minutes time of flying these kind of missiles uh, if, the, if the West chooses uh, to use this uh, power. If it doesn't, then it becomes a question of intentions. And Putin also said on multiple occasions, something that realists would relate to, that we don't make our decisions or judgments based on intentions. It has to be based on capabilities. And all this talk that NATO countries are also democratic countries is just NATO propaganda. We simply have to have meaningful sphere of influence, meaning, meaningful sphere of neutral states, which a lot of it has to do with security perceptions, but some of it, again, has to do with history. Some of it has to do with Russia's perception, historically established perception, that it must have meaningful buffer zone 
between its own territory and Western powers, because it was attacked for the last 300 years or so, predominantly by Western powers. And that's why Stalin and Churchill negotiated this. That's why so many Russian policymakers believed and insisted that this entire area called Ukraine and ideally Baltic states in Moldova and Eastern Europe must be separate area, neutral, better yet friendly to Russia. Two more questions uh, about Ukraine, rather specific ones. Uh, the first from Gerard Towell, which is a, a question which has so often uh, occurred to me. What, in your opinion, accounts for the Kremlin's failure to understand Ukrainian public opinion on the eve of the war? Uh, how, you know, in a country next to Russia, largely Russian speaking, where the Russian intelligence services were clearly extremely active. How, how, how did the Kremlin get it so totally wrong? That's, and that's what's this, uh, Gerard asks, um, uh, the, the, res, uh, the, the result, as people have argued, of Putin's isolation as a result of COVID, of, of a predominance of uh, um, growth of historist, historicist messianic thinking on his part? That's a great question. And of course, uh, I do not have very good evidence. Much of it is my own uh, inferential evidence, if you will, speculations. I think it's a combination of uh, several things. Certainly, Putin is a believer that culturally, Russians and Ukrainians constitute the same people. They have the same roots, the same historical roots. They both sprang from uh, Kiev roots. They have gone separate ways for several centuries, but then since the 17th century, they were part of the same state. He believes that it's essential for, for them to preserve as close affinity as possible. That does not necessarily make him an imperialist per se, because for all these years before 2022, he was willing to tolerate a different Russian state, if you will. And that's how he thinks. That's how many people think in the Kremlin. And there is a record for that. So here we can argue with evidence that they believe that they could be more than one Russian state or pro-Russian state as long as they are either neutral or friendly to, to each other. So that is the underlying values background to Putin's state, his beliefs, realist ideas. Uh, but of course, what contributed to this was uh, in part his sense of loneliness and isolation. This is when he produced all these treaties about Russians and Ukrainians. And also, I would, I would not take lightly the bad advice, specifically from people such as Medvedchuk, who told him on many occasions that uh, Ukrainian forces are not likely to fight back, that there will be a Nazi battalion and Aidar and other nationalistic battalions um, uh, with Nazi ideology, they will put up a fight. But the uh, Ukrainian army most likely will uh, uh, either surrender or will try to find peace with uh, the Russian army. And you might recall as a indirect evidence of this that Vladimir Putin already, I think two years, two, two days or three days immediately after he launched the uh, uh, so-called special military operation in Ukraine, he went public and invited Ukrainian military to take matters in their own hands. Uh, essentially, he was inviting them to become partners and to solve this issue even without, even before the so-called Istanbul negotiations were launched. So this is a combination of things. This is something that uh, he miscalculated for cultural political reasons and for bad advice as well. And he was influenced by Medvedchuk until that moment. Yes, um, America is not the only great power to have suffered from what one might call the Ahmed Chalabi syndrome uh, of uh, That's ambitions. a good parallel, yes. Yes, I mean, which, uh, uh, well, anyway, I mean, there are, there are so many parallels in the end between some of Russian and American both actions and mistakes. Um, following on from there, a question from Nelson Brown. Uh, what were the Russian government's goals when it invaded 
Ukraine, in your view. Um, I, it, did, did it, it, it thought presumably that it could create a puppet government? Did it think that Zelensky could be turned into a puppet? Was it still the image of, say, the invasion of Czechoslovakia that was influencing it in terms of what, what it could do? Which is odd because, of course, 11 years after Czechoslovakia, there came the intervention in Afghanistan uh, right. to, uh, to, to replace the communist dictator there, which did not turn out very successfully. I think, uh, again, this we, we are yet to find good evidence of what happened. There is a dispute uh, as to what the Kremlin intentions were. And just as it always happened with Putin before, he was very much playing by the air. He was very much trying to determine what he could get, depending on how this special military operation would go, depending on, on the reaction by the West. Uh, he was probably influenced, very much influenced by the United States regime change strategy, by the U.S. foreign policy interventions in Yugoslavia, Iraq, and elsewhere. And he wanted to do regime change, but in his own way. Uh, this is where Putin's style is important to understand. He is very much of an asymmetric player. He does not want to have a symmetric fight. He wants to have a quick and effective special operation rather than a war. And he is better at special operations because he was trained uh, in those while, while being a, a security agent. So he was hoping to do regime change relatively quickly to have another uh, Crimea operation, if you will, on a grander scale. That backfired for various reasons, for the reasons that we're trying to understand. He began to change his strategy. He withdrew, he engaged in the, in the uh, uh, negotiations and came very close to negotiating a deal in Istanbul that was then interrupted for various reasons, including the West unwillingness to embrace it. And then uh, soon after this already, I believe in May, uh, one of his deputies, military deputies said that the goal right now is to secure the territory that cuts Ukraine from the Black Sea. But the initial objective was, as you remember, is that Ukraine is neutral and demilitarized, one. And two, that Ukraine um, renounces its uh, nationalistic, read Nazi ideology in Kremlin's language. And that objective was now in place, but only for, for the territories that Russia will be able to uh, conquer to liberate, depending on where you're coming from, use different language. And here, the idea would still be would still be the same. The policy behind this, I believe, remains to secure Russia from potential encroachment by NATO. If Ukraine is essentially split in two parts, one being controlled by Russia and one that cuts Ukraine from the Black Sea. That creates the buffer zone that Putin believes might be sufficient, that jeopardizes Ukrainian security capabilities, even if Ukraine is in NATO. And that, of course, by definition, solves the Russian question that Putin saw, sought to solve in the first place. And in historical terms, of course, that means that Russia takes, or it would say takes back, the territory that the Russian Imperial Army uh, conquered from the, the and that's how that's how the Kremlin makes sense of it. That these are essentially Russian territories. They are populated by pro-Russian communities. There is much Russian blood in there, and we were willing to keep these territories within relatively friendly state. But if it is against us, then we will take it by force, and we will not stop until we have control over these territories for cultural and for security reasons. Which suggests the possibility of a long war, alas. Um, it seems it seems that based on this perception and based on the perception in the United States, in NATO, both sides are not willing at this point to, to engage in meaningful negotiations. And there are no good offers on the table either. Uh, there are some signs that the West is considering freezing this conflict 
But again, treason doesn't solve Russian concerns, even if the West is willing to do so, which is also a big, big, big question and a big if. So I have to say in conclusion, I mean, even a frozen, an unsatis a very unsatisfactory frozen conflict like Kashmir um, with intermittent bursts of violence is better than two years in which we've seen hundreds of thousands of people, uh, people killed. Right. Um, you so have people, Anatoly, you have people speaking of schools of thought, you have people who are arguing in Russia, they are more moderate than hawks for, for this kind of semi or uh, approximation of the Korean scenario, Korean division. But of course, it's very difficult to accomplish. In Korea, you have, what is it, three or four miles uh, DMZ in Ukraine. It will be uh, perhaps 100 miles or so. It will be very difficult to sustain. It will still be the source of potential insecurities for Russia. And it will probably create more incentives for Ukrainian nationalism. So it's not a solution. And this is why moderates who are arguing this, this line of thought, we understand why they're doing so, we understand why westernizers prefer settlement, but in the, in the absence of these choices, in the absence of Russian security, it's likely to be the prolonged conflict. Well, on that cheerful note, Andre, thank you so much for a, a really thank interesting you. discussion. Um, I'm sorry, that's all we have time for. And I, I do apologize to all the people uh, whose questions I couldn't ask because there were so many uh, questions inevitably uh, to such a very interesting uh, and perceptive speaker. So thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much for having me, Anatoly. Uh, and I, uh, I hope to see um, some of you tomorrow for our debate on China policy. Thank you and goodbye.